Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. Good to have so many visitors, see some that we are familiar with from before and uh, have returned again, to, especially to be with family members. But we're thankful for the presence of everyone. Glad that Brother Whitehead was able to be back with us. He had surgery this past week up in Georgia and is healed sufficiently that uh, he's able to be with us. And we're grateful for that and for everyone else. Not too long ago, a significant archaeological discovery was reported in the newspaper, the Jerusalem Post. The headline read, Nehemiah's Wall Uncovered. The article stated, the remnants of a wall from the time of the prophet Nehemiah have been uncovered in an archaeological excavation in Jerusalem's ancient city of David strengthening recent claims that King David's palace has been found at the site, an Israeli archaeologist said Wednesday. The section of the 2,500-year-old Nehemiah Wall, located just outside the Dun Gate and the old city walls facing the Mount of Olives, was dated by pottery found during a recent dig at the site, said Hebrew University archaeologist Dr. Eilat Mazar. When you look at this map of the city of Jerusalem, you see right at the bottom is the Dun Gate. That's where, near where this discovery was made. And that gate, matter of fact, is still in operation. But Dr. Mazar, the archaeologist who rose to international promise, prominence for her recent excavation that may have uncovered the biblical palace of King David, was able to date the wall to Nehemiah as a result of the dig carried out underneath a nearby tower, which had previously dated to the Hasmonean period, 142 to 37 BC, which now emerges was built centuries earlier. As a result of the excavation, both the 30 meter section of the wall and a six by three meter part of the previously uncovered tower have now been dated to the 5th century BC based on the rich pottery found during the dig under the tower, she said. Scores of bulli, arrowheads, and seals from that period were also discovered during the excavation. This find opens a new chapter in the history of Jerusalem, Mazar said. Until now, we have never had such an archaeological wealth of finds from Nehemiah's period. Nehemiah, who lived during the period when Judah was a province of the Persian Empire, arrived in Jerusalem as governor in 445 BC with the permission of the Persian king, determined to rebuild and restore the desolate city after the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians a century earlier in 586 BC. So this is the historical background and the contextual background we see to our lesson this morning. We look at Jerusalem in the time of Nehemiah. We see the Dun Gate at the very bottom of the city walls on the eastern side. But this is the area of Nehemiah's wall. This is the area that they're talking about where these great archaeological discoveries were made. When you look down here, you can see, if you note very <laughs> uh, noticeably, in the very center of this picture is a blue tarp. That blue tarp is covering the work area of the archaeological dig. It is this area that the wall of Nehemiah has been unearthed. Here you can see archaeologists digging under that blue tarp, and you can see in front of them is a portion of the wall that was built in the time of Nehemiah. When we look to Nehemiah, it's good for us if we're going to understand what was going on and what impact it has on us by looking at a brief summary of events, because maybe not everybody is familiar with Nehemiah and what took place during this period of time. Nehemiah lived in the 5th century BC. Babylon, as predicted, had fallen, and the Medo-Persian Empire had come to power. Now, efforts had already been made on the part of a remnant of the Jews to return and to rebuild Jerusalem. But in 536 BC, Zerubbabel and nearly 50,000 Jews returned and began the work of rebuilding the temple. 
They laid the foundation, but soon ran into opposition and ceased the work of the house of God, according to Ezra 4.24. God then raised up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, and through their influence, the building of the temple resumed in 520 B.C. In 457 B.C., Ezra, a priest, returned to Jerusalem along with an additional contingent of Jews, set up many spiritual reforms. In 445 B.C., in the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, Nehemiah undertook the task of rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. So that's where we are with Nehemiah's walls. But let's consider the man Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a Jew, but he was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. We know that from Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. To be a cupbearer to a great monarch, and remember, the Medo-Persian Empire was ruling the world at this time. To be a cupbearer to a great monarch was a privileged position. Only a person who had demonstrated that he was totally honest, totally worthy of trust, could be selected for such a position. It required that the cupbearer taste the king's wine and food to make sure it was not poisoned, and to share the same sleeping quarters to make sure the king was not assassinated. This put him in close contact with king and queen, and developed a relationship with them that was closer than the normal individuals. He had an attitude of concern about him. Being a Jew, he was concerned with what was going on, or really not going on, around Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakliavah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. When we look to Nehemiah and his attitude of concern, one of the things, being in the position that he was, an important position in the Medo-Persian Empire, he was not so carried away with his own position that he was indifferent to the plight of his people and their beloved city, Jerusalem. If you look to verses 3 and 4, you can see his grief after being apprised of the situation in Jerusalem, how terrible it was. They said to him, those who had come from Jerusalem, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He was totally touched by this, concerned, compassionate over what was taking place or what was going on in Jerusalem. So he took action. First, he fasted and prayed, according to verse 4, as we saw. Later, when the king inquired concerning his sadness, before replying, he, he prayed, we're told, to the God of heaven, Nehemiah 2 and verse 4. He then given the opportunity by the king, personally went to Jerusalem and personally surveyed the situation. After seeing it firsthand, he addressed the people. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verses 17 and 18, he and the people went to work. The challenge that Nehemiah gave to the people was for them to overcome their adversaries, to overcome their adversities, and to resume the work on building the wall around Jerusalem. The people responded to that challenge by rising up and building the wall. Let us look now at the second chapter, verses 17 and 18. I said to them, Nehemiah said, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of my king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. He had encouraged them to rebuild the wall, and they started that task. 
Well, opposition soon arose to the work that they were doing, and that opposition came in many different forms. When we look to the opposition as it's presented unto us in the book of Nehemiah, first of all, it started with scornful laughter. People were laughing at them. Their enemies were laughing at them. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, when Symbalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Jeshem, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at us, despised us, and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? They thought by building this wall, they were going against that which the king would want them to do. But actually, the king was encouraging this. But they were laughing at them. Then not only did they laugh, did they laugh but their laughry, laughing turned to mockery. In chapter 4, verse 1, So it happened when Samballot heard that we were building the wall, he was furious, very indignant, and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. That's telling him how weak they think their wall is going to be, that a mere fox could cause it to collapse. The opposition then grew to conspiracy. In verses 7 and 8 of Nehemiah 4, it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem. Create confusion. But they knew they couldn't do it just outright. So they formulated a plan of deceit. In the sixth chapter, verse 1, it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Jeshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors on the gates, that Sanballat and Jeshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. They were going to draw them out there and do away with them. Then they began to tell lies against them when they could not come and would not come. In Nehemiah 6, verse 6, And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, let us consult together. Nehemiah had no plans to be their king. And so now seeing that their deceit didn't work, there were threats of open warfare. Verse 7, it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ash Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored. The gaps were beginning to be closed. They became very angry. All of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem, con create confusion. This did not stop the people. Even though they knew the enemy would be coming up on them, as they were rebuilding the wall, some had to hold a weapon in one hand and a working tool in the other in order to keep on building so that they might be protected from their enemies, but yet continue the work of rebuilding the wall. And in spite of such strong opposition, they completed the task in a very short time. Nehemiah 6 and verse 15, the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elu in 52 days. They said, let us rise up and build. They met the challenge. They built the wall in a very short period of time, in spite of their enemies being so vociferous in their attitudes against them and their anger against them. Well, how does all this apply to us, or does it? Our challenge is to rise up and build. In one week, we are beginning a new year. And it's very common at the beginning of a year for brethren to be in a mood or a mindset, to be influenced, to rise to the challenges set before them. 
even in some of the resolutions that they are making. But just as there were obstacles to doing the work of rebuilding the wall, there are obstacles today which keep us from accomplishing that which the Lord desires us to do. Well, what are some of those obstacles to the work? There are external obstacles, materialism, indifference, worldliness, that we can see not only among those out in the world, but sadly among some who claim to be God's people, that they're materialistic in their views of life. And seeking to build, instead of building up their treasures in heaven, they're building up the things on earth, which will perish. There is indifference that let others do it. (laughs) I can't be bothered. There is worldliness that people are giving themselves over to the things of the world and not to the things of God. There, add that to the internal obstacles. Some are unavoidable. Ill health, advanced age and the things that accompany it. But some are avoidable. We talked about materialism, indifference, and worldliness. A lack of oneness, where people are not united to do the work of the Lord, not giving themselves fully devoted unto the Lord and to one another. And there is also a lack of faithfulness, where people are not loving the Lord God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Well, what will it take for us to mirror the success of those who rebuilt the wall under the leadership of Nehemiah and accomplish the work that the Lord expects of us? Why this account in the Old Testament is so relevant to us is that the same things that worked for them and made them successful will work for us today. What are those keys to success? Sincere interest. As we saw in Nehemiah 1 verse 2, came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. There was devotion to the cause of God in the mind of Nehemiah. And he was devoted to seeing that goal, building of the city of God accomplished. There is genuine concern, and we are to have genuine concern about the things that are set before us and the problems, the things of adversity that we might encounter. In Nehemiah 1 verse 4, it was, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept, mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Prayer is to be an integral part of that which we plan and purpose to do those things that God would have us to do. Fervent prayer, as the prayers of Nehemiah, need to be the prayers offered to God today. He said, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We are told in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. Why? Because James 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Look at what the prayers of Nehemiah brought about. Our prayers can bring about the same today because as he was one of the people of God, we are the people of God. And we are serving the same God that Nehemiah served. And God is no respecter of persons. As he listened and answered to Nehemiah, he will listen to us and he will answer today according to his will. But we need to have honest humility. Nehemiah was not seeking to be king, but Nehemiah just wanted to accomplish what he saw needed to be done in Jerusalem. In chapter 1, verse 5, I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah was not asking for the blessings of God because he and the people were so righteous. He knows 
We've sinned before you. I have sinned before you. My father's house has sinned before you. But please, reach down and help us. Because there was that internal commitment. As there was eternal weaknesses and things of an adverse nature that came with some, there was that internal commitment that Nehemiah instilled within the people. It came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King X. Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sat in his presence before. Therefore, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. He humbly was before the king. He humbly was before God. And that humility caused him to arise and to be obedient unto God, and unto even that which the king had commanded. Why? Because he had a strong faith. To his enemies, he said, I answer them and said to them, <clears throat> the God of him himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. That great faith gave him great courage. In Nehemiah the 6th chapter, verse 1, it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Jeshim, the Arab, the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, though there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates. That Sanballat and Jeshim said to me, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? I think there's a lesson just in that statement of Nehemiah there. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. We must not set aside the Lord, his body, and the tasks that we are to do in relation to it for the menial things of this life. First and foremost, we are to serve our God and bring glory to him in our lives, and accomplish that which he would have us to accomplish. Look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, where the Apostle Paul said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Nehemiah had that courage. Paul had that courage, and he wanted that courage to be in Timothy and to all others who would read his epistle. The people had a mind to work. They built the wall. The entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Do we have a mind to work? Is that important to us, to be doing the good works for which we're created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 and verse 10? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58 once again. And if you're going to think about something this day, think about that. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs> I don't know whether I can do it. I don't know whether I have enough knowledge. I don't know whether I have enough faith. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You, he could do it, you can do it, and I can do it. If we have that faith of Paul, of Nehemiah, if we have the courage of those men, if we have the faithfulness of those men. As we bring our lesson to a close, there comes a time when concerned people must draw their line in the sand and declare they will not retreat. Our society is trying to press upon us principles, thoughts that are totally contrary to the will of God. 
We cannot give in. We cannot turn aside. It's a time when they must resolve to go on the offensive. We are not to just be defenders of the faith. We are to take the faith of Jesus Christ to the world. If you study history, you know one of the most important events of the past century was World War II. And one of the most important events in World War II was D-Day. There was a time when D-Day finally arrived and the Allies needed to act. The troops on the Normandy beaches choked on the smell of death and the taste of fear. But they did not turn back. In all, 30,000 GIs were killed, 200,000 wounded in the Normandy campaign. But it was a turning point. For 11 months and one day later, there was an unconditional surrender of the Axis forces. Was it worth it? Your answer depends upon your estimate of the value of freedom. Now we go to the Garden of Gethsemane. When our Lord was upon the earth, D-Day had arrived. How he must have recoiled, saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But it was not possible. And he went ahead willingly with it. Was it worth it? Yes. For it provided for spiritual freedom. Many people tomorrow are going to remember his birth. Thank God for his death. Our D-Day has arrived. It's a time for us and all Christians to be on the offensive. It is a time not to shrink back. It is time to be actively doing the will of God. With me, may we, as God's people, rise up and build. David's going to lead us to number 269. We call it an invitation song. If you need to redo your dedication, devotion, commitment unto the Lord, we can help you do that. Or if you need to come to the one who died for you for the very first time, we can help you do that too. Nehemiah was a great leader. One who directed the people of God to do good things. Jesus Christ is our leader, our master, our Lord, our King. You could ask for no better leader. And he's asked each one of us to do what we can to further him and his kingdom. Are you in a situation where you can do that? If not, we can help you be. Let us know how we can help you by coming forward while we stand and while we sing. What can wash